Alpha, we have a serious problem. Your mother will not give her consent for you to be here. No. I'm very sorry. I no. tried everything I How could. How could you call her? She will never let me go. Not as long as Welfare keeps sending her money. Why would you do this to me? Because she threatened to call the police and charge us with kidnapping. <gasps> what do you have against your mother? What Did she ever abuse you? What did she do? I don't want to talk about it. Every day there are young women faced with crisis pregnancies and they're seeking a home. A new film, Gimme Shelter, exposes the plight of one such woman. It tells the story of Apple Bailey, a teenager on the run who finds herself homeless and pregnant. Vanessa Hudgens of high school musical fame stars as Apple in a transformative role. I'll bring you our conversation later in the program. But first, I want to introduce you to the film's director and screenwriter, Ronald Krauss. I sat down with Ron, as well as the remarkable woman who inspired the film, Kathy DeFiori. Now, DeFiori is founder of a string of shelters for homeless mothers and their children in New Jersey. Here's my conversation with Kathy DeFiori and Ronald Krauss, the director of Gimme Shelter. Tell me, first of all, how you met. Kathy's been doing this work for 33 years, and one day someone sort of tapped me on the shoulder and said, have you heard about this place? these shelters, this woman, um, and it's in New Jersey. And it happens to be a mile from where, where my brother lived in New Jersey. And so one Christmas I went to New Jersey to visit my brother and every holiday, uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, I go, I go to food banks, I go to shelters, I, you know, I sort of give back. I had no agenda or intention of doing anything other than just, it was right there and that was the place I was gonna be giving. And I went and visited Kathy and uh, introduced myself and walked into this holy ground, a place, you know, I've been to a lot, a lot of places. I've never seen anything like what I saw there hmm. and um, was very moved. Before I knew it, I was there for a period of, uh, for the first month of January. I remember it was uh, January, it was 2010 actually. And... Uh, a young girl, I came to meet her one night, and a, a young girl was standing in front of the shelter. Um, she was about 18, uh, African-American, 15 degrees out with no coat on, standing right in front of the shelter. And I said, what are you doing out here? It's freezing. I said, come on inside. And she thought, I worked there, and I thought she had lived uh, in the shelter. And You neither, found out that wasn't true. <laughs> neither of them were true. Okay, uh -huh. and, and I'm sitting there talking to her in the shelter, and Kathy shows up and says, who is this girl? What, what, do you, what, is she, what How did she get in the shelter? Because then Kathy took me to the side and said, never let anybody in this shelter who doesn't belong uh -huh. here. Because, you know, they have rules and it could be dangerous. Oh. So I said to Kathy, you know, this young girl, I said, she doesn't have a place. She's standing out here without a coat. Uh -huh. Do you have a, a bed for her? She said, let me talk to her and see what's going on. Uh -huh. And I'll let you know. And she comes back to me and she says, Ron, you know, we do have a bed here. So... If you want, you could tell her she could stay here. For whatever reason, I don't know why she'd said that to me. And so I went to Darlisha and I said, hey, Darlisha, I said, uh, you know, there's a bed for you here. They have a bed for you here. You know, and she hugged me so hard, she almost knocked me over. And, and it mm -hmm. sent like a jolt into my heart that was unforgettable. Mm -hmm. And from that point, I went home. My head was reeling, you know, of... Mm -hmm that there are so many girls like her out there that perhaps I could do something that, you know, I didn't expect to be there. It was like a calling or something. I just came there and I said, you know, and yes, I am a filmmaker, but I said, perhaps I can do a story that could reach so many people. A documentary would not do that, but a film, you know, is the way young people get their message Taking today. information today. Take information. Mm -hmm. It's the modern literature. So I, I approached Kathy about this and she said, absolutely no. Not about her. And I said, fine. And as we sort of... Because I, initially you were going to hang the whole story on Kathy and her journey. Yeah. Ah. And about her and what she does here and so forth. And the obstacles of building the shelters yeah. and starting in your own home. Because yeah. it seemed like such an obvious David and Goliath story mm -hmm. about a woman who was homeless herself, 
with Mother Teresa, built her life back, helped others, ends up in the White House. That's a movie. Mm-hmm. And, and it seemed like the obvious thing. And she said, no, not about her, she says. Impossible. Right? And she says, this is what we do. We do the work here. Um, I've been surviving like this because I don't do that, you know. And, mm-hmm. and because I just focus on the work and nothing else kind of gets in the way. And so I lived at the shelter, to make a long story short. Uh, and you're writing as you're living at the shelter. Yeah, I told uh-huh. you it was the cliff notes. And uh-huh. I, I lived at the shelter for about a year. And unlike a lot of films that are based on a true story, this was based on a true story, but it was our true story. In other words, mm-hmm. I was there. It was revolving around me the whole time. I interacted mm-hmm. with these girls. I was part of their lives. Mm-hmm. And now the audience becomes part of their lives. Mm-hmm. So after I cast the movie, I went back to the actual shelters shot the movie in the real shelters with some of the real mothers huh. and 23 of the babies from the shelters. Hmm. Um, now, you feel that when you're watching it. It feels very authentic. It doesn't yeah. feel like a synthetic Hollywood recreation in Burbank. Why did you decide to bring in the James Earl Jones character as a, a priest being the vehicle that sort of brings Apple into this world and takes her off the streets? It was highly inspired the answer to your question is, I don't know. James Earl Jones, we were so fortunate to have him. Uh, you know, he's so likable and I needed somebody to really carry that torch of wisdom mm-hmm. and compassion. Yeah. And who, who better than him? I mean, oh, no, he, he has such amazing, I mean, yeah. gravitas and this inner light that's just astounding. I mean, yeah, he's, he's great. He, and he studied to be a priest when he was younger. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, I think that's true, right, Kathy? He told me he that. He wanted to be. He a wanted priest. to be a priest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's and and something. and he just understood the character. Mm-hmm. He really did, and he understood compassion and care, mm-hmm. and he knew that that role was so pivotal. Kathy, I want to talk to you for a moment. Uh, I have heard your name for so many years, and and interestingly enough, had never seen you in all these years. Why have you been so media shy? given the breadth of this work that you do? My focus is the mothers and the babies, and I never really wanted to be involved in media. Um, I got a lot of phone calls, Ray, from people that Mm. wanted a 16-year-old that was pregnant, and maybe her mother was pregnant at the same time, and they would appear on a talk show, and Mm -hmm. I didn't even tell the girls about those phone calls. I just wanted them to focus on being good mothers Mm. and learning about God and and, and understanding all the responsibility that motherhood came yeah. to them with. Yeah. And I enjoyed the work. Yeah. You know, going out, meeting people, getting my face on TV wasn't the work. The work was them. Uh, Kathy, tell me how this started. I mean, you were a mother, um, successful NYU grad like me. Uh, wh- wh- what happens? Then you find yourself homeless for a period. I was in a very abusive marriage uh, Mm. for quite some time, and I had to make a choice, and that was just get up and leave. Mm. And that day when I walked out, I knew that I was not going to have anything, and I was just the purse. Um, I was homeless for quite a while, Mm. and I understand what these girls go through. You're from friend to friend, place to place, an insecure future. Eventually, because of that education, I was able to get a decent job, eventually a small home. Hmm. The prayer of St. Francis of Assisi was always with me. Make me a channel of your peace. Hmm. That prayer, I must have had 15 copies of it wherever I was. And as I prayed that prayer, God's peace just totally just flowed throughout my troubled soul. And once I, I was able to stand on my own two feet, I studied about his life, right? And this was back 33 years ago, um, and I found a few books, and I realized that he built his ministry around Matthew 25. When I was homeless, you took me in. When I was in prison, Mm -hmm. you visited me. And that's what I started to do. I made a to-do list. And I went to Railway State Prison. I set up a pen pal program there, maximum security prison. And I had a woman that was dying of adult acute leukemia. I brought her into my house. And then I said... Why don't I take in a pregnant woman with the baby? And that's how the ministry, the true ministry started. But I never knew that that was the seed that God was going to blossom. In the film, we see 
some pretty intense situations where, whether it's mothers or boyfriends or other people in these girls' lives, there's often abuse surrounding them. That's why they're on the run or they have to uh, seek shelter. Um, what prepared you to deal with that human part of this equation? Well, God graced me with a loving heart, and uh, I like to take courageous steps, mm -hmm. and he was always by my side, guiding me, the Holy Spirit, and I always felt, and up until today, sitting across from you, that he would never give me anything to do that he didn't help me do. Mm -hmm. So I kind of don't have a lot of fear. You, you did get into a little scrape when you opened your house, and the state of New Jersey said this was an illegal boarding house that you were running, Kathy. And you, at that time, encountered a pretty amazing woman who I had the great fortune of interviewing and knowing, um, Mother Teresa. What was her impact on you? What was that interaction like? I want to step back a bit, okay. Ray. I met her because of the fine, the $10,000 fine, and the governor was going to veto the legislation that was going to be passed. And I saw her on TV, I prayed, and I heard a voice inside my head say, contact Mother Teresa. I denied that voice. Then I sat down for a cup of tea, and I heard a screaming voice in my head, contact Mother Teresa. Hmm. I've never done this in my life before, but I prostrated myself on the floor. I knew that it was my guardian angel. It was maybe God. I didn't know who it was, but it was something wonderful. And within four phone calls, because I had met a man in Washington, he had given me his number. He oh. said he worked in her soup kitchen. Oh. I called him. She got on the phone to these people. She helped get the fine removed. So from that point forward, we became friends. I have letters from her, meetings that I had with her, a shelter that I uh, established in Newark for homeless women because of her. I hope I've answered your question. Oh, no, no. You, you know, Rick, can I just say one thing? Ahead, sure. The, the interesting thing that really fascinated me about her sort of ministry, her, her work, which I still don't understand, but mm -hmm. that they survive day to day for 33 years. Mm -hmm. Like, like they rely on the the goodness of others. Why I'm at this shelter, I swear every second I'm there, someone's behind me showing up with this, with that, a box of this, a box of that, dropping stuff off. They have no business plan. They survive day to day on, on, on donations from people that have no government support, they have no whatever. So she's not giving checks to anybody. Mm -hmm. they're, people, they're dollar to dollar there every day. I don't know how they survive. But that was one of the fascinations. Like mm -hmm. I was like, this place exists because somebody wants this place to exist. Tell me about the Mother Teresa statue that Ron mentioned earlier. I was at the Missionaries of Charity, and um, there was this statue that uh, they were letting go because it had a problem. <laughs> it was Jesus. He was 12 years old. No one recognizes him because he has no beard, and he's in this red garment, but it was when he was in talking to the Pharisees and the scribes mm -hmm. in the temple. And he had a staff, but that was missing, and his hands were missing. So I guess Mother and the nuns had decided that Jesus was retiring. Time for that one to go away. <laughs> he was yeah. about three feet tall, and I said, no, no, give him to me. Yeah, because I said to her, why does the statue have no hands? And she says, because we, we have to become the hands to help others. Mm -hmm. And now, and the statue's in the movie. When James Earl Jones first and, oh, and, and that's Vin, right. And when they first come in, yeah, the you'll see the statue. Shelter, yeah. It's right there. So now the movie is becoming the hands, mm -hmm. reaching out to other people. I also love that the film, and I, I, I want your reaction to this. You come away with this great renewed dignity for the life of this forgotten child, this girl on the street, these people that frankly we all turn away from every day or ignore in the hustle and bustle of life. I think it gives dignity, it gives a true meaning to what love is. It gives an understanding of um, patience and kindness. They support each other. That's what I think people have to get out of the movie. Comfort each other. Mm -hmm. Do it in a godly fashion. Yeah. Be those hands. Be I the love hands. It. Well, thank you all for the film.